now to a clock on Tuesday, April 20th, and we welcome you to our coffee shop webinar on now is the time to rethink your nonprofit marketing. So we're really glad that you're with us today. Uh, we know it does take often a few minutes for everybody to log on. So as everybody's getting ready, um, we just want to go through um, a few details about um, today's session. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Amy Wong, and I'm president and founder of .org Solutions. Uh, for those of you who do not know us, we are a marketing, PR, and fundraising consulting firm that specializes in working in the nonprofit sector. Um, our company works with uh, a variety of nonprofits, large and small, across uh, a variety of uh, different areas. So um, we've been in business since 2009 uh, and have done a lot of work within our, our region and throughout the U.S. So um, that's just a little about us. Um, if you could just uh, please do a quick wave and let us know if you can hear us. So we always like to make sure that we can uh, test our audio so that we know. All right, great. So we've got some no problems with audio and video. So thank you for confirming that with us. Um, the first thing I'd like to do um, as we are about to get started is just talk a little bit about the .org Solutions Coffee Shop. Um, the .org Coffee Shop is part of the .org Solutions Cafe series, which is our way of providing free professional development opportunities to those in the nonprofit sector. Our coffee shop webinars are something that we started uh, last June as uh, really a way, kind of our way to respond to some needs that we saw during the pandemic to be able to help our friends in the nonprofit sector and provide them with some just really free uh, or free and um, really quick things that they could do to get them on track. Um, but what we found is a lot of people were very um, receptive and have been receptive to our webinars. So we're continuing to do those monthly. Um, and we will have special webinars uh, if there are particular topics that we feel are relevant at that time. So really the goal of these is to be informative but relatable. So um, as you can see, we um, have a panelist today that we're going to be talking with. And for those of you who have been on our webinars before, we try to keep these a lot in a Q&A type format. And we will have our panelists today who I'll introduce in a minute. Um, and we will also have a moderator and our chat box moderator. So you'll only be able to see us. So if you're trying to uh, see the rest of the people on the webinar, unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to do that today, uh, nor are we gonna be able to have conversations back and forth. But we do encourage you to use the Q&A feature and also the chat feature throughout the webinar, and we will do our best to answer questions in real time. Uh, we will also have five to 10 minutes at the end of the webinar so that um, people can ask additional questions from our panelists today. So uh, with that, uh, we will go ahead and get started with our webinar for today. Um, for those of you um, who have been with us and were with us last month, we actually talked with Tracy Burt from the Akron Community Foundation about the importance of aligning marketing and fundraising plans for impact. Today, we want to go more in depth and talk about why now is a good time for nonprofits to rethink their marketing. I think all of us know that COVID has changed the way we do a lot of things. And frankly, some of these changes are going to stay with us for better or for worse. But one of the big changes that we see and we have been seeing is the way that people are searching for, receiving, and using information. And that's a big portion of what we're going to be covering today and talking about why now is really that time to start to rethink your marketing uh, to your constituents. So that's whether they're your donors, your clients, patients, patrons, volunteers, or whatever constituents you may have within your nonprofit organization. So I would like to welcome our guest panelist, uh, Jim Tata. Jim has been a channel account manager at HubSpot since 2018. And Jim works with marketing, PR, and growth agencies like ours to help our clients reach financial goals. Uh, for those of who are not familiar with HubSpot, HubSpot's a marketing sales and service software that helps organizations grow, and it provides a wide range of expertise in marketing through relevant content. So many of you, if you've searched for particular topics around marketing, you may have actually downloaded a piece of HubSpot content along the way. Uh, they're a very prolific organization in terms of putting out relevant content about, uh, about a variety of marketing 
sales and communications uh, things. Prior to HubSpot, Jim worked in FinTech, selling software for advertising agencies, help them streamline and automate uh, their media buying. And that's actually where Jim first learned about HubSpot as a CRM. Uh, Jim has a bachelor's degree in communications from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and has lived on both coasts, uh, but he has now settled in Southern New Hampshire with his wife, two sons and family dog. And uh, actually earlier, Jim and I were talking about how they had a little uh, freak snowstorm last week. And, and then I shared with him that we're gonna get the same this week here in Akron. And, and we thought that it was too late in April to be able to, to have those. So Jim, I'm, I'm really happy that you're with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and excited to, to talk through this, this, this coffee shop uh, webinar here. Well, great. But before we have our conversation, there's a couple things that I um, wanted to go over. And I mentioned earlier that there were quite a few things that changed during the pandemic. And uh, one of the things that I really think has changed the most is how we communicate and gather information. And that has changed, I think, rather radically. And in my mind, I believe that nonprofits who really start to understand and adapt to these changes in communication delivery are going to see the most success long term. So just a couple of quick um, little tidbits that I found, and, and we will actually share these articles uh, with you so that you can read them. They will be in our follow up email that goes to all of our, our participants and registrants for the email. Um, but the pandemic, first of all, changed the way we read. So the sales of ebooks, books, audiobooks increased dramatically in the last year. People are also reading more about issues that are prevalent in the news. People are reading more about social issues. So overall, people are actually reading more and they're seeking out a lot more content to help them make decisions. Changes the way we communicate. Um, people are communicating more often in different ways. I was actually on a, a call today with someone and I said, had you ever used Zoom before the pandemic? And he said, absolutely not. So they're connecting through Zoom. They're connecting with handwritten notes, uh, virtual gatherings. I've, I've received more handwritten notes in the mail in the last year than I have probably received in the last decade. Um, Older generations are trying new technology to stay in touch. Social media has exploded in popularity because people have had time, it's a way to connect. Um, extroverts are obviously missing the in-person interaction, but also we saw that um, introverts are also missing some of that in-person interaction as well. People are also looking for different, um, looking for information and services in different ways. Um, you think about the things like libraries being closed. So that's probably, um, why a lot of people went to ebooks and, and to things like Audible because the internet is always open. You think about doctor's offices were closed and how many people had to pivot to telemedicine. Um, banks closed, you know, how many people are now doing online banking that never did online banking before? Um, and charities like many of you had to close or really modify what you were doing. So, you know, online giving, uh, may went up in a lot of respects, but also searches for services went way up. And then how people look at charity actually is a lot different as well. So giving data is still mixed right now. I think there's still, I know uh, Blackbaud has its giving data report that, that recently came out for 2020. Um, it's up in some areas and down in others. So it's really mixed kind of data. And then people are also spending more time researching your organization, not just for services, but to make their giving decisions. So I wanted to put some relevance into the questions that I was gonna to talk to Jim about because you know, as there, there are just so many things changing um, that understanding what some of the big ones were I thought was gonna be important. So, you know, Jim, I think I want to actually, you know, talk to you kind of in light of those things that um, I just mentioned. Obviously, consumer behavior has really changed radically in the last year. Um, can you share with us some of the biggest changes you've seen since the pandemic? Yeah, yeah. I think I think to talk about the changes since the pandemic, we want to talk about some of the things that were happening even before the pandemic and, and show the shift kind of like as a contrast. Because um, I know before the pandemic, you know, HubSpot was around clearly <laughs> before the pandemic. We started in 2006. And, you know, where we thrived was people educating themselves on things they wanted to, to buy, right? Whether it was B2C or B2B. Um, people would read, you know, read up, 
do their research, read their blog posts, but this was really a lot more on consumer goods, right? Like washing machine, your car, you know, when I would buy guitars, <laughs> I would, I would read up on them or home improvements. Like I would read up on roofing companies and a lot of those things that, you know, you were doing a lot of inbound motions prior to the pandemic. It's not like the pandemic forced it. Um, but prior to the pandemic, these motions didn't apply to things like personal hobbies, personal endeavors, right? Personal passions. Um, and a lot of these things that pertain to the charity, the nonprofit sector that you see out there, um, you know, Pope, you know, for your personal passions, for your um, hobbies, a lot of the things that you learn about were word of mouth, right? Your social circles, you would hear about something and go to an event, right? Um, in person meetings, because you know, you would have your meetings for your personal passions. And then obviously mail traditional, you know, mail, traditional advertising out of home, um, all of those things. So it's really interesting because a lot of the a lot of the shifts that I've seen since the pandemic started has been in those, those motions, those those privatized motions in B2C and B2B have now moved into the NPO sector. So you think of things like Movember, you think of things like GoFundMe, you know, all of the peer to peer giving that you see with all of these these things that have come up since March of last year. And, you know, what's happened is, you know, younger organizations, younger, younger people and younger organizations were always kind of in tune with that. But I think with the pandemic, now everyone has had to become in tune with that, especially with their giving, right? Because you don't have these charity events you're going to. Um, and then now we're really like the shift has happened, right? Not just from the, the fact that it's out there and that's how you do your giving, but from an age standpoint, right? People are starting to research everything online. It's not just millennials. It's not just Gen Z. Everyone's been forced to. So now, whether it's a B2C, it's a consumer good, or it's a personal passion, or it's, you know, really anything that you want to do when you interact with the outside world, you're kind of using an inbound motion. You're researching online. You're reacting with these marketing assets. And, you know, that that's kind of what we've seen. And, and, and it's kind of not industry specific anymore. It's It's ominous. Every industry needs it and, and takes part now. So, so would you say that the pandemic somewhat accelerated a digital transformation um, that was just kind of starting to take shape? Yes, I would say so. I, I would say it accelerated it from a, an industry standpoint and an age standpoint, right? Because you always had, you know, a lot of folks that were already going through these motions in privatized businesses and like Gen Z millennials were already doing a lot of it. Even in the NPO, that's why we I mentioned you know the Movember Foundation. I mentioned the GoFund the GoFundMe's all of all of those. Um, but yeah, I think now the pandemic kind of forced the hand of folks who were resistant to these online motions and telling your story online versus in person. Well, and I think too. I mean, I mentioned Zoom. Uh, you think about how many people had never been on a Zoom meeting prior to last year, or any kind of any kind of face to face thing. How many people had never been? Or, or had been on very few webinars over time. Um, you know, podcasts, I mean, podcasts I know have just exploded, not just in terms of people listening to them, but people actually doing them. There's over um, a million now in America alone, over a million podcasts. So think about that worldwide. Think about that in a year once everyone starts getting their equipment. Yeah. Well, and also too, it's like, I think a lot of people are, are starting to, you know, cause I, I know I was talking to somebody um, earlier today too. And you think about like the, where the shifts have gone and, you know, when social media first came out, everybody's like, oh, we have to go all into social media and, and they did. And then they tried to figure it out and some people figured it out and some people haven't, mm -hmm. then you have, but then they neglected websites, right? right? So you have website neglect and everything. Well, now that, you know, people are spending a lot more on top, time online. Websites are becoming, you know, it's like, oh shoot, you know, you almost can't really de be neglecting all of those, those kind of things either. Right. Well, when when you think, if you think about it, especially if you're trying to drive something, most what we've seen, the most successful businesses out there, the most successful organizations in general, what they do is they they pay attention to social media, but these social posts still drive them to a website and still begin that journey. And then that's where the marketing conversion happens. And that's where you start to gather the information. And, and then if you do need to do some outreach, you know, they've came, they've come to you from a social standpoint, but you've gathered their information. Right. Right. Um, and that, that's the exact, it's, it's really the, it's the digital exchange of information that's happening now. Um, 
and it's it's so funny we we talk about um podcasts i was at when you said that i just it made me realize like i now since the pandemic started i don't watch tv in bed i turn off all the lights and i just listen to podcasts to go to sleep like that's my nighttime routine so it's it's really amazing how everything is shifting even with people who thought they were kind of savvy and in tune with this yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, we, we again, we talk about, you know, people being forced to do things that um, didn't exist before. Um, and, and I think that's what nonprofits have had to do in, in many cases. Is, you know, I, I hate to use the word pivot because pivot, I think, is becoming very overused as part of the yeah. pandemic, along with quite a few other buzzwords that we talk about here. But, you know, people were, were forced to, you know, meal delivery services and online grocery orders, um, telemedicine, job search, and other work-related activities. And those are not just behaviors that are unique to those, but that's the way that people are starting to look for information and interactions with their nonprofits as well. Yeah, I totally agree. I think with, with those ones you just mentioned, like online grocery delivery, especially early on in the pandemic, telemedicine. And I, you know, it's one of those things where it wasn't just adapt and overcome. It was adapt or you won't be able to get what you're used to be, get, you know, you used to get right. prior to the pandemic. And then what happened was a lot of folks who were maybe resistant to, to the online aspect of this. Now they're like, oh, I know how to do it. It's super convenient. And now all of a sudden <laughs> you see, you know, that's how we get, you know, it's so funny. My wife was away on a girl's trip this past weekend and uh, my, my kids were like, I need groceries. And I was like, I can't get out though. Cause my parents were in Florida. My wife's in Florida. I'm like, what am I going to do? I went online grocery shopping. I, next day I got it delivered to my house and I was able to take care of the kids. It's like the pandemic forced the infrastructure for that, but it benefited me because I embraced it. Well, yeah, and you probably are more of an early adopter because of, of your age, right? And whereas the thing is, is we're finding too that old, older people too are really starting to say, oh, I actually kind of like this. I kind of like doing um, things via Zoom. And when you think about, you know, rethinking your marketing, it's not just a, everything outward facing. It's how are you interacting with your boards? How are you going to interact with your boards after you're allowed to be in person? Is how are you still being able to offer training? So, you know, it's almost like an incl it's inclusion as much as it is, you know, we talk, we're hearing a lot about diversity, equity, inclusion, but this is also an inclusion activity as well, that by having a larger amount of people understanding these technologies that we're actually able to be more inclusive in our organizations as well. But that's something we can't just say like, well, the pandemic's over, we have to be done with it. It's how do we continue to use that as part of what we're doing? Yeah, it's almost like it's it's it kind of ties into the social versus website. It's the it's the digital versus in person. I think moving forward in an ideal world, the you know, we'll start to start interacting in person more and more, but I think you don't want to neglect the online uh, revolution that happened during the pandemic. You want to, now you're going to have to use both. Just like you had to pay attention to social and your website, you're going to have to pay attention to your digital footprint and your digital interactions along with your in-person because that's just the way the world is now we've we've discovered a technology and what and we're not going to abandon it because it's too darn convenient right right absolutely well you you know you mentioned digital and when i think of you know digital done well i do think of um, organizations that have inbound marketing approach and hubspot's known for being a pioneer in inbound and you've mentioned inbound a couple of times but inbound is probably a lot more familiar to those who have worked in the for-profit sector as opposed to the nonprofit sector, um, even though the concept has been around for a while. Can you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, really the relevance of inbound and nonprofits, but also maybe also understanding um, what is digital versus some of the some of the other things that we may think are digital? Yeah. Totally. Um, so inbound. Yeah, that's kind of our favorite word. Actually, our big conference every year is called inbound and went digital last year because of the pandemic. It's all coming full circle. But uh, the def the textbook definition is, is you know, it's building meaningful, lasting relationships with consumers and customers. But and what it means is these buyers, these these your customers, your clients are educating themselves through marketing assets. And what that leads to is the customer coming to you inbound, the leads are inbound versus you going out and finding them outbound. Right. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's funny, the, the kind of the, the nonprofit way and what I've seen, not how I've seen nonprofit succeed is very similar in the sense they take the stories and the information that they were maybe 
um, portraying at these events or talking about or sharing. And they just take those same stories, um, case studies, everything, and they move them online and make that part of what we call the journey, the inbound journey. And it's all the same things that were successful. It's all the same stories. It's just now it's part of a set of marketing assets that's designed to bring folks to you, right? Whether it's for fundraising or for donors or for board members or for memberships, all of those things, um, things that you used to have to do outbound, right? Because, and that's the, what we're always talking about is outbound versus inbound, right? What's the difference? You know, out, you know, in a past life before, if you don't have an inbound methodology, you have folks who are picking up the phone and trying to do outreach, right? Smile and dial, right? Whether it's public or private or nonprofit or for-profit, that's what outbound was. And now you have this awesome marketing content and those same stories that these outbound folks were sharing on the phone, you can have online for someone to consume. And oh, by the way, with technology that's out there, including HubSpot, when someone interacts with that piece of that marketing content, they read the blog post, they click the button, they fill out the form, you as the organization who puts out that content gets intel, gets feedback. So if it is, you know, if you are fundraising, someone who's consistently hitting your website and consistently reading your case studies, maybe you do have a fundraiser pick up the phone and call them. And it's the truth of the matter is the most successful deployment of inbound I've seen is when inbound is the main catalyst to convert these, these folks, but you still have some type of outbound reach with a warmed up client. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and I think that, um, you know, a lot of nonprofits have a lot of great content. It's just how are they deploying it and how are they capturing the information that comes from it? So it's, you know, how do you share that on social media and have people go back and get more from your website? And how do you, you know, connect with them about, about learning more? And are there, and, and I think with nonprofits too, we, we talked about our last session, again, with Tracy Burt from Akron Community Foundation, they have two different types of people that they're marketing to. They're marketing to donors and prospective donors, and they're also marketing to the nonprofits themselves. Mm -hmm. Whereas many nonprofits are marketing to the donors, but they're also marketing to prospective clients. So, there are definitely opportunities um, to do that for both both sides, and um, I think that you know people are starting to realize. Well, I shouldn't say realize. People are starting to be really discerning um, about the information that they believe and trust. And so, as nonprofits, I think um, you know there's a lot of opportunities to be able to provide that information. So that you can build those trust among, among your, you know, constituents. I totally agree. I think not only that, not only building the trust and knowing that you, you have good information that people, you know, will absorb. And to your point, they'll discern that they're going to go through the fine tooth comb. I think that's why personas come into play. And you mentioned folks marketing to different types of, you know, whether it's a donor or it's a member or it's a nonprofit partner themselves, you can create, we call them personas, where it's your ideal client profile. And you can say, okay, this is the type of person who will consume X, Y, and Z. Let's create a drip campaign or a nurture path for them. And these are the types of things that you can, you can talk about those personas and you can set up these nurture paths so these folks can, um, you have an idea of how they consume their information and you can be ready. And you can actually use metrics. You can use, you know, you can look at the statistics of your content to see, oh, this content led to a lot of new members. We should be doing more content like this. And then there you go. You can develop your persona and your strategy. And as, as a quick pitch, actually, for, um, for our next two webinars, we're going to be talking a lot about um, you know, nurturing campaigns and drip campaigns and what a lot of these things that Jim is mentioning, and we could be spending hours and days talking about all this, but we'll be talking about that in our next webinar in May. And then also we'll be talking about measuring and um, understanding what the numbers mean in our June webinar. So um, we're trying to build this as, a, as something as kind of a, a progression for those of you who are, are visiting us today. I, I won't go too deep into the weeds. I won't steal the thunder. <laughs> Uh, no, no worry. So, you know, I think the big challenge though for a lot of the nonprofits right now is like, you know, how do you plan for marketing post pandemic? Um, and, you know, HubSpot is really great at following a lot of trends and kind of looking at predictive trends. What are some things that you and the team at HubSpot are seeing, you know, for marketing in the future, particularly as that might pertain to nonprofits and how they need to approach 
um, what they're doing when they're planning their own marketing. Yeah. I think we kind of touched upon it quickly when we talked about doing a combination of digital and in person as we start to exit this dark period of being home so much. <laughs> you know, uh, inbound, our inbound conference was um, uh, digital last year. It's going to be digital again this year. And I think, you know, I don't know if what we have planned, but I, my, my guess would be, and what I've seen is a lot of slow, almost, I hate to use the word drip, but like dripping of in-person events. Like, okay, we're still going to still, we're going to be careful because we're not out of the woods yet. But what we're going to be doing is, okay, let's not turn away the idea of something being in person. Let's explore it until we, we can't anymore. So we're not just automatically saying, okay, we're all digital now. Now it's like, okay, can we, can we pull this off in person? Is there value? Is there inclusion? And, and I think the answer for the next six months to a year, whoever knows how long is still going to be a combination digital first and then in person as well. Um, and I think that that's really the, the trend we're going to see. And I think that's not just in terms of events. That's going to be in terms of hiring. That's going to be in terms of memberships. It's going to be, you know, remote first. And then if you can, and you're willing, and you're willing to take on that risk, do it in person. And then I think eventually we're going to land on a combination of both. You know, here's how you attend digitally. If you can come in person, you're willing to, let's do that. And I think that's the future of any type of event um, or any type of interaction with an organization and their customers or clients. And keep in mind, that's my guess, a lot of editorialization, but I know we're still going remote digital first for now for the foreseeable future. Absolutely. So we do have a quick question and I might have to do a little shameless self-promotion, but you can talk about this too. So the question is, do you have suggestions on who to consult to review your campaigns and make suggestions or advise if you don't necessarily have a marketing person or department? Well, do you want to answer first? Or do you want me to take it? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I would say, you know, I think it's really important to um, talk with an agency who really understands, I think, um, nonprofit marketing and an agency that really understands digital space as well as the inbound space um, and the outbound space. So, I mean, I, like it's a little shameless self-promotion. That's kind of what we do here at .org Solutions. So, um, but there are, there are agencies that do specialize in this. Um, and I think that that is a, a logical or possible way to go about it. So Jim, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. No, I think you're spot on. I think uh, Scott's question here is really good uh, because, you know, if you don't necessarily have the marketing person or department and, and, and as we see it at HubSpot, our customers, we kind of have two different sides of the house, if you will. We have, we have our clients who do have a marketing person or department. And in which case, not only are they using our software, but then, you know, we consult with them and they have consulting, but it's ultimately up for the organization to deploy it themselves. To Scott's point, if you don't have that, if you're a nonprofit, if you're a small company, if you're a startup, this is where an agency can bridge that gap where you don't have the bandwidth to deploy new software or create all this content. That's why we have an entire agency program and HubSpot has a set of agencies, .org being one of those that we trust to deploy our software and can be that bridge if an organization doesn't have that. So no, I, I would say I totally agree with you. So are there any other trends that you're seeing you know, for the future? I mean, I do think that's really interesting because that is a, a big question. I think a lot of nonprofits are saying is like, do we take our event in person? Do we have it online? And I am starting to see at least in our region, a blend of mm -hmm. that where some people are starting to dip their toe in with some of these smaller events. They're, um, you know, trying to decide whether they're going to continue events that they had before. Some are completely online. Um, but beyond those kinds of things, are, are you seeing any other shifts in whether it's social media, social media advertising? Because I've seen some things come through my inbox that social media spends are going to be way up, but that's probably more on the B2C side, and things like that. Yeah, I would say, I, I would totally agree. I think it's going to be in the ad spend right? Um, you know, whether you're doing it on social media through Facebook or LinkedIn, but Google AdWords, right? I mean, we, that's always been popular, but I think much like to your point, you said it used to be just a B2C thing, just like inbound used to be a B2C or a B2B thing or a for-profit thing. And I think now you're going to see, okay, well now to get the word out there, instead of doing a billboard, now I'm going to do Google AdWords, right? Instead of taking an ad out in the newspaper, I'm going to do paid social, um, I, so to your point, I think a lot of those traditional advertising dollars, even that nonprofits were doing, they're going to be going to digital instead of traditional. So that's another trend I'm seeing internally. I'm seeing a lot more use 
of the ads tool, uh, especially, you know, to your point, not just, hey, buy this widget, not in the private sector, but, you know, um, and I'm going to keep leaning on Mo no Movember just because I know donate to them every year and they're, they're something that I, I, I really like and enjoy. I get great emails from them. Their, their newsletters are second to none. Their digital newsletters are second to none. They always have calls to action and driving you to the website. So once again, it's about that shift of things that you're doing traditionally, just going digital. And aside from events, I think ads, paid social are big as well. And those aren't necessarily, I mean, those might be driving not donors, but they could be driving donations, right? So, Correct. I mean, they could be driving, you know, let's say you are an organization that has, has a high need for um, a donation of particular goods, whether that's used clothing or um, things that, you know, can be donated to um, maybe a food pantry or you know, those particular calls, those are things that can be used and, and nonprofits can get some free Google ad stuff through, um, through Google. I think it's up to $10,000 a month still that they can get too. So um, there's opportunities for, for nonprofits to be able to use some of those free, free services that are available to them. You made me think of one other thing in terms of trends with nonprofits specifically is it's, you used to think of e-commerce as, you know, Oh, I'm going to buy something online. It's going to get shipped to me. But e-commerce, the act of the website being the point of sale and using a tool to do that, that's another thing we're seeing a lot more nonprofits do. And I don't mean it just like, you know, you know, you know, being accept, accepting PayPal or using a, a credit card capture tool like Stripe um, to, and, and not just having that live in a vacuum as a point of sale, but making it part of your inbound campaign having a call to action, having a newsletter, having a button at the bottom of your emails, donate here brings you to a landing page where you can donate and have a form where you edit your, uh, enter your credit card info. So yeah, I think all of that is really becoming more prevalent. Yeah. And I think too, you know, is, is the calls to action are a big one that I think are missed a lot, but also the, um, the follow-up emails of talking about how those donations are being used and building those relationships with people over time. Totally. The statistics of them, you know, how are they being used? Where are they allocated? Here's a case study. And all of these are kind of like self-propelling pieces of information because then they become blog posts or they become newsletters. And oh, the, the flywheel is spinning. And not only are we promoting ourselves and delighting our customers and our clients, but we're also getting more folks into this flywheel of our, our nonprofit growing. So I, I'll refer to the flywheel. So the flywheel, I, I tell Jim, I make fun of the flywheel because HubSpot thinks that this whole, so sales is typically, they think of it as a funnel. Um, and so HubSpot a couple of years ago introduced this, this flywheel and I'm like, oh man, you guys, nonprofits have it so far ahead of you because nonprofits have really worked on the flywheel concept for much longer than um, people on the for-profit side with the identification, cultivation, solicitation, and stewardship. So it, when he refers to the flywheel, um, go ahead and use the, the donor, uh, the donor journey and the donor life cycle. For yeah, that as a it's so funny. We bought, yeah, we took a page out of that book because to your point, we retired the funnel because mm -hmm. the idea was the funnel. Okay. You've made your, and I'm talking about the private sector or, you know, if you relate it to nonprofits, you get your donation, you get your membership and then they drop out of the funnel. Well, then what happens once they've landed? So we changed it to the flywheel because, okay, they're, they've donated. Okay, now let's give them content. Let's make a case study. Let's get them to donate again. And, and it's a flywheel because we want it to continue to spin and be self-propelling versus just having it a funnel, drop out, and then you're going to start them at the top of the funnel again. Or you have to lose them and get them again, which is very... Right, lose them, very... get them again, backfill them, right? Or start from scratch. Exactly. It's, it's a, so because these nurture paths, this inbound we're talking about, and this is a good point, isn't just about net new. It's about keeping your, your best clients, your best members in the funnel or in the flywheel and keeping them top of mind so they don't just fall out and then you have to start from scratch again two years later when, you, when, you need, when you're trying to get another donation or get them to become a member. So, so what should nonprofits be thinking about when playing their content online and offline? So, because I know that everybody's going to say like, whoa, we've been talking about a lot of high level stuff. We're talking about nurturing campaigns. We've got this new word called inbound. We're talking about flywheels. My head is spinning. Um, you know, what are some things that really nonprofits should be thinking about kind of based upon the trends that we, we've been talking about at this time? Yeah, I would say one of the biggest things, if we want to get one layer deeper, because we, we have been talking high level, but let's get a layer deeper. 
like gated content, right? That, and, and that's something we can dive into, um, you know, meaning things that you need, it's a give to get, right? And that flows right in line with nurturing campaigns. And, you know, these campaigns are great that, but you're not just throwing info at these folks, you're getting info as you're giving it. And that is all related. Um, so I would say those are kind of two of the biggest things because we are talking in theoretics and we're like, okay, but it's not a drip campaign. It's not just throwing emails. It's, hey, do you want to see our latest case study? Do you want to see where these donations are going? Well, in order to get that, fill out these, fill out this form or submit your email. You see it a lot for, believe it or not, in the private sector, you see it a lot for getting a quote, right? Like get a quote for your roof, just put in your email. Well, you can also do it for white papers or success stories or want to see where your money goes? Well, here's an email and we'll give it to you. And that's what we mean by, by gated content. And, and it can be in the midst of these campaigns. And, and I think it's interesting that, you know, when you talk about gated content, because I think nonprofits as a whole, they want to be able to give everything to everyone. And I think that there's, there are definitely ways where content can be ungated for people who have already engaged with you. So let's say you have a donor and they want to come to your website. Um, you know, you can make it such that they don't have to um, fill out the form, right? Correct. But somebody who might be, um, you know, just coming to look for information, well, you know, that's a great opportunity and a great way to build your email address list is that you can actually have them come download something and then um, they'll be added to your, your list for communication. So um, that's probably, that's something we'll talk about actually a lot more in our webinar in May. Um, again, not to get too much in the weeds today. So, um, so, so we already talked about what gated content is. Um, yep. let's talk, uh, we, you know, we talked about a lot of these other things like nurturing campaigns and, um, you know, how do you communicate to different audiences and buyer personas? Um, but what, what actually could a nurturing campaign look like for a nonprofit, maybe looking for donors? So, a nurse, so yeah, and this is good. And this is why we want to call it a nurture versus a drip. Because I think when you're nurturing, you're, you're still giving this information like a drip campaign, but the difference is, and this is, I think this is the answer you're looking for in terms of what's the difference is as they go through this process, if they click an email, you can send them down one path. And if they don't, you send them down another. So I think the difference between, a, 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 like if you're a, let's say you're a nonprofit and you send out a newsletter, right? And at the bottom of that newsletter, you do have a call to action button. That is whether it's give or do you want to attend our next event? Just something for the, the person you're trying to reach to interact with, right? In that newsletter. So th this is cool. So, so far we're still in drip because there's a newsletter, but there's a call to action. Now, what you can do with that, especially if you're a nonprofit, is if someone clicks that and actually interacts with that marketing content, you can, boom, you can maybe, if you have a fundraising team, if there's a fundraiser, send them a message via SMS or on Slack or on email saying, hey, this person who could be a high level donor is clicking our stuff. You should pick up the phone and call them, right? So that's, that's one way that you can use a combination of inbound and outbound. And then if they don't, continue to nurture them. Okay. They're not ready to click yet. Maybe we send them something else. And then it's good because on top of it, you can continue to use these interactions and we call them if then branches, if they click do this, if they don't click do this, you can use this to further qualify or further disqualify your list of folks to reach out to therefore making your segmented lists of potential donors or potential members really, really relevant and not just this ever growing list that doesn't have any hygiene to it. So you can use the nurture campaign to kind of weed out serious folks from non-serious folks. That's just one example. Yeah. And I think also you can use it for different, um, like your year end giving campaign or yeah. a specific giving campaign. So if they're clicking on certain content, they get certain content. If they, if they don't, they don't. So you know, it's, um, there's a lot of different ways that you can use that. And it's, um, you know, again, people are accustomed to it. And I always say to people, um, when I was just first new to learning about the whole inbound methodology, I said, um, I just started looking at my email. Mm -hmm. I just started to look at the emails that other people sent. I looked at the emails that I got from the 40 emails that I get from Bed Bath & Beyond like every week or, you know, some of these others. But then you start to think like the more you would 
click on certain things, you could actually start to see how they interact with you based upon your interactions. And you get so, different things. So like if you click on bath towels, you get a heck of a lot more bath towel emails versus if you click curing cups, right? And that's right. a different branch. And that's that's segmentation. So all of that, a tool on the back end is segmenting you and giving you this persona and you know saying, okay, this this is so now it's not just it's not like there's a marketer saying, oh, they've clicked this. No, it's it's AI that's doing it. And saying, okay, she's interested in bath towels, curing cups, you know, and, and curtains. So let's get her on these different lists. Well, which is interesting too, because I think that's another trend that a lot of people aren't really, you know, that's that's really new to the nonprofit sector. I think it's new to a lot of sectors too, is you know, artificial intelligence is gonna play a big role in a lot of how marketing is as a whole, mm -hmm. um, but also how, you know, to try to make things a little bit, a little bit simpler. Um, we did have another question, um, but about a non nonprofit that has a good established mailing list of donors and supporters. How do you build communications with relevant contacts, attendees, advocates, donors, supporters, especially in the new normal of virtual communication? Yeah. So, so building communications is key because I think to your point, I think the difference, and I think what Scott's asking here is not just throwing info at them, but you know, building a back and forth, right? And I think this is where the inbound and outbound combination comes together. And I think to your point, Scott, I think this is where you want to start to segment. And you know, you can also do something that's called lead scoring. And what that means is as these folks are interacting, you know, you have a mailing list and you're sending these things out, you know, let's say they interact with it, you can give them certain scores and then it's like, okay, hey, this person's really into what we're doing. We haven't placed a phone call or a thank you, or at least an outreach. Let's do it. And then to your, the beginning part of your question about mailing list. It's funny when I was in FinTech, one of the things we did was we used direct mail to start the digital communication. What I mean by that is when we sent out a mail piece and we had a mailing list, let's say we had their address, but we didn't have their email. We would send out a mailing piece that had a, a link or a QR code or visit this website. And, they, and the website would be a landing page where they convert. And we've done traditional mailing, but guess what? Boom, they've converted digitally. And now we can start those relevant communications. So I would say a combination of turning the traditional to digital and then within that digital, using the intel that you can get with all these great technologies that are out there to realize, okay, this is a high value donor or this, is, this could be a high value member. And we have all of this info. So let's pick up the phone and not just continue to send them emails. And I think that's, you know, in, in the nonprofit side of things, that's a capacity and propensity discussion that um, often, you know, organizations have. So you may, um, you know, find that somebody, and, and I would say if you're mailing to somebody and then they're interacting with you on a digital level and they're clicking on your call to action, their propensity is, is relatively high. If you're yeah. mailing to them and they never connect with you in any way, they may have high capacity, but their propensity is probably not so high. And so, if you're scoring those motions, right? If you're giving value right. to those motions, you don't even need to like dig into an Excel sheet and look, boom, when you pull up, you know, when you pull up their profile on whatever tool you're using, there'll, there'll be a numerical value value that you've assigned to them because they, they're like a high propensity value versus low propensity. And then you can start creating those lists to, to do outreach and your fundraisers can pick up the phone and call them and make them feel special because they've been reading your stuff. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think, you know, if I look at one of those, those trends that I think is going to stay around for a while, and I've always touted this with, with fundraising in general, fundraising is um, so different. And I think I shared this with you, Jim. It's like, you know, I always, people that are in sales don't realize that fundraisers would be like amazing salespeople. Definitely. Um, and well, then they're, often, they're getting and money often, without a product, right? Salespeople are getting money mm -hmm. with a product. Yeah. Fundraisers are so good. They don't even need the product to capture money. <laughs> so yes, yeah, I agree. Well, but I, but I think the point of that really is, is that, um, you know, fundraisers are really good at making connections. And that's something that oh, we've been all missing, I think, in the next year or in the last year. And I think as we start to come out of all this and we start to have those personal interactions again, um, those are, that's got to be a, a really critical part of what we're, what we're doing. So um, um, let me see. So we are good. We have one more question, then we'll take some questions. 
Cool. Um, there are many nonprofits that successfully use content to drive giving. And so that's either print content, digital content, however you have it. But not every nonprofit has the budget of a national charity, a large regional nonprofit. Um, what are some just easy things that they can do in the next month or two to ramp up their marketing? The first thing I would say is if you don't have a CRM right now, there are plenty of free ones out there. HubSpot being one of them, but I, I want to be impartial. But there, are, I would say at least get a CRM, a free CRM, where you can start to, you know, capture this information. And I don't just mean like a digital Rolodex. I mean, there are some CRMs that will allow you to connect to your email inbox and see email opens, right? Or see website visits. So I would say get a, find one of the free CRM and marketing tools that allows you to get Intel on things like your website hits and your email opens. That's one of the easy things you can do now. The other thing I would do is if you don't have templated emails for branding, that's another very, very, you know, it sounds simple. It sounds stupid, but it's really, really important because what you can do is as you have these digital assets that are being created and they're consistent, you know, none of this stuff costs money if, if you have the CRM set up and then you have a, an email template. And then even if you need to take that template and copy and paste it for now, because you, you don't want to pay for a service like a HubSpot or MailChimp or a constant contact, you know, these are the things that you can do to make it to, to kind of play in the sandbox with the bigger players. But if you have good branding, if you have your customer information and you have your list segmented, even with small, small profit and small bandwidth, you can at least get the same information. So I would say that's a, that's a great start. And I would say there's a couple things too. So um, a lot of organizations already have a donor management system. So there are friends on the nonprofit side may not be familiar with CRM, which is a customer relationship management system. They may be more familiar with, um, you know, things like Razor's Edge or Donor Perfect or Kindful or Little Green Light that they would use for those. Um, but I think that, you know, those are definitely being able to capture your information. So even, you know, if you have everything on an Excel spreadsheet or um, do find a place to house that, that is something that uh, is really important to you know, make sure your data is managed all in one place. Um, I would actually add that if you have not given your website very much love um, in the last 12 months, I would really look seriously at um, making some critical updates to your website. So whether that is having, you know, updated donors or updated uh, stories about, you know, successes at your organization, um, any information. And if you don't have information about even upcoming events, whether they're virtual or not, um, I think it's really quite, quite interesting. Um, Jim actually just posted something in the chat, which is called websitegrader.com. Um, and that actually will help you kind of um, get some suggestions on how to upgrade your website. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Just keep in mind, the grader itself is free. So this will tell you, this will give you your score and give you your options and tell you things you need to improve. Um, and you can choose to do those on your own. And, and this is a great tool. Actually, it's so funny, you know, to do it in the next month or two, when we say get a CRM, get a, a free, which is free, grade your website. All of these are free right now that we want to get you started with. So I would say start with those two things. And then I would also say, you know, maybe take a few minutes and just um, assess where you are. I mean, are you feeling completely overwhelmed by all the things you think you should be doing? Um, are your board members telling you that you need to be on TikTok and you have no idea why? Um, we, use, we, we pick on TikTok because we like TikTok, but it's not for everybody. Just as Instagram's not for everybody, just as not just as LinkedIn's not for everybody, um, and as a small nonprofit, I think it's really interesting for them to just you know do. You may be better off doing a few things and doing them really really well than trying to be all things to all people. But I think ultimately, kind of do some things that are that are really um, always think of think of your donors and your customers and how they would want the information that you want them to have and how they will interact with it. So um, this is a great question and I actually, Jim, I will totally defer this one to you. Um, so, you know, do you feel that, e I mean, obviously we're, we're all kind of big into digital marketing right now and that's because, you know, trends are showing us that that's where people are living and that's where the most success is. But 
you know, do you feel emails are bothersome and get spammed or deleted as solicitations? Great. That's a great question. question. It's a really good question. And I think it's so funny because there has been worldwide legislation on this, uh, though. I don't know if anyone's familiar with GDPR, right? The, the Global Data Protection Regulation, which started in Europe and now is on, you know, it's in the United States and it's basically worldwide now. But to your point, this is why with GDPR, if you've noticed whether you go on a new website or you get a new email, there's a, you have to have the unsubscribe right? And that, that footer has to be on there. Or now, if you notice about a year ago, every time you go on a website, it's always accept cookies, accept cookies. And all of these things have to do with exactly that, not being spammed and avoiding that. And, and what I think was, is, is to your point, Scott, is this can be scary and think, am I ever going to be able to email again? And it's like, no, I actually see all of this as a great qualifier for serious versus non-serious recipients. And what we mean by that is if someone unsubscribes, I'm actually thankful because I no longer have to waste my time. And if, or if someone is interacting with these emails, then I know. Now, that being said, it is very important that you don't over email, you know, no more than a couple times a month, right? Um, because one thing I do is I still have a lot of emails that I don't unsubscribe from because I like the information. I like their product. Guitar Center, right? I've dwindled it down to the absolute minimum because they could get too much but I use that. So I would say, I feel like emails, especially from basically like the years 2000 to like 2016, were extremely spammy, were extremely bothersome because filters weren't great and there wasn't any legal protection. I think now, if you're following GDPR, you have the proper unsubscribe lists and you're giving relevant content and not over emailing, it's an excellent, excellent way to, to qualify your prospects and leads and without having your time wasted. So I would say it's kind of a, a double-edged sword, if you will. And, and I will say too, um, and this is something I've just learned over the last couple of months, is there's, if you have a large email list and you have concerns about the emails, um, whether they're good, bad, indifferent, beyond um, spam, there are some very inexpensive tools that are very similar to the national change of address. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been, um, We've been actually working with some of, some of our clients. One is Kickbox, mm -hmm. um, which is really great. So um, we can actually, I don't have the email address or tip it off the top of my tongue, but um, you know, you have Kickbox um, and Neverbound are a couple. If you, and they're very inexpensive. You can run you know, 20,000 email addresses through for like $160. And they give you a whole bunch of data so that you actually know how your email subscribers are, are um, interacting with you. And that's really important, especially for nonprofits who are, um, you know, if you are having a paid subscription and you only have a certain amount of contacts that you can have within your system, you can actually then figure out who, you know, isn't interacting and, and who is beyond what just, what's the bounce is so. Great, great example. And this kind of ties in with your last question about what can we do now? This too, because, and this relates to kind of the last two questions, because if you're using a never bounce, you're kicking out all your bad emails, you're deduplicating, you're seeing which emails are actually getting these, right? You can now, and then all of a sudden, if you're using a tool that's analyzing opens, you can see, oh, okay, this email is working. And then if you're looking at your emails, oh, this email had a, you know, 50% open rate of 25% click rate. Let's keep doing that. Let's format our emails like that. But this one was barely open and we got a lot of unsubscribed. So let's avoid, maybe that was too wordy, had too many links. And you can use this Intel to try to mimic what's working and dish what's not. All right, so we have about two minutes left. Um, and what I would like you to do, Jim, is just give us any final thoughts that you have before we wrap up our webinar today. Yeah, I would, I would say that my final thought here, especially in working partially in the nonprofit world, I work both in public and private sector in terms of who's using tools like this. I would say the pandemic, you know, to wrap it up, the pandemic has forced the hand. And I would say there's a lot of tools out there that you think are just for for profit or for private sector businesses, but nonprofits can use them, you know. I work with partners like you who work with nonprofits who totally take what should be a private sector tool 
and make it beneficial for nonprofits. I have another partner who strictly works with municipalities on their economic development organizations. You know, these business, these parts of cities who try to get businesses to open up. You take these tools that you think are just for selling widgets or selling commodities and you can use them. You know, you might have to ditch the nomenclature. Like we have a lot of things that say sales at HubSpot that aren't sales. It's, <laughs> it's just, it's building one-to-one -one connections, right? So I would say utilize the tools that are out there, open your eyes and don't be afraid to try out new tech, especially if, if it's working and you see the bigger players doing it. And I think that's why, you know, we wanted to do this session today was because, you know, again, the pandemic has really forced a lot of change and a lot of people are thinking very differently and using technology very differently. Um, I mean, you know, I was just as a aside, I was on a, a bridal shower this weekend on Zoom. Well, even if there wouldn't have been a pandemic and I wouldn't have been able to go, I still could have, pro I would still probably join. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of opportunities for people to interact with you that don't need to be tied to place and space. And so you know, thinking about all these tools and how people are really trying to frame their lives. I think they're also trying to take a lot, you know, people have enjoyed actually a little bit of the extra time to themselves in some respects. And so, you know, the more that we can be respectful of people's time, I think is going to be going to be key as well. So I totally agree. I think the theme of our conversation today has been where we've been forced to go more digital. And I actually, I saw Scott use the term adjunct, digital adjunct to traditional or as a supplement. And moving forward, having the digital option, not just being digital or just being remote and just being in person, combo it. And that's going to be the future of the world. Yeah. And honestly, for the, I mean, we've been really pretty high on digital because that's just a lot, that's very new to a lot of people in the nonprofit sector. Um, but I will say, we still do believe that um, there's a lot to be said for still using um, traditional you know, direct mail and things as a complement to digital. So we're not anti-direct mail. Um, we just really thought that this was more about, you know, thinking a little differently about, about current trends. So Spot on. like I said, my first experience with HubSpot was using it in conjunction with direct mail and it was incredibly successful. Absolutely. Well, we have like a few minutes left. I'm just going to say if anybody has any additional questions, um, we will be happy to answer those. Um, and then uh, in the next couple of minutes, and you can throw those in the chat or in Q and A. Um, but as we are waiting for any of you to type, if you're so choosing, um, we do have a couple upcoming coffee shop webinars on Tuesday, May 18th. We're going to be talking about implementing and improving digital presence. So we're going to be taking a lot of the things we talked about today, and we're going to be putting those into um, a little bit more practical application, just because we didn't have as much time to do that today. Um, and then we are also going to be talking in June about how to measure that. So um, we've got about two minutes to spare. It looks like um, we don't have any questions or chat from anyone. So um, if you are looking to uh, contact either Jim or myself, our contact information is on the screen right now. Um, and Jim, we thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, it's a very interesting time for all of us, especially in communications in the nonprofit sector. And uh, we appreciate your insight. I, I appreciate it as well. I mean, I think, you know, I think we, we've we been handed a lot of lemons over the last year. We got to try to make some lemonade. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you everybody for attending today. Um, actually, I did have something. Oh, we got to thank you. So you are welcome, Debbie. We're glad that you could attend. Um, but have a great day, everybody. And for those of you who are um, in Ohio, get your shovels out for some shoveling tomorrow morning. Uh, stay safe and have a great rest of the week. Awesome.